Hello, everyone. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you guys so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday and you are not going to want to miss it. We also upload the video version onto YouTube on Wednesdays as well. So make sure you are subscribed. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about another unsolved case, and that is the case of Ashley Summers. Ashley was 14 years old when she went missing in July of 2007 out of Cleveland, Ohio, and to this day, no one truly knows what happened to Ashley. This case, similar to a lot of unsolved cases that we go through, is a case where once we get to the end of it, once I tell you the information that we know, you'll be looking at me like Savannah, there's got to be more. And this is, again, one of those cases where we just feel like there's not enough information out there. Like Ashley's case has not been given the spotlight that it needs. And so that is why I chose it to cover today. And I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it. Ashley Summers was born on June 16th, 1993 in Cleveland, Ohio to her mom, Jennifer. She grew up the firstborn for Jennifer and the first baby of the family, having 10 aunts and uncles and her grandparents, so she was doted on and adored from the second that she was born. Now, Ashley's biological father was never a part of her life, so having that support system from the rest of the family on Jennifer's side really helped shape Ashley, and it also really made her value family. Family. As Ashley got a little older, her mom met a man who would become Ashley's stepfather, and him and Jennifer would have five other children. Now, with Ashley being the oldest, she really did step up when it came to watching her younger siblings, and she really helped Jennifer out a lot by being able to take care of them, take them to the park, and she was also really great with kids. She loved having younger siblings. She loved being able to play with them, spend time with them. Again, Ashley really valued family, so this was very, very important to her. Now, Ashley and her mom were always extremely, extremely close. Her mom actually says that they were more like best friends than they were, you know, a mother-daughter relationship. They were just that close. They were like sisters. Every summer, they would go to amusement parks together. They would also watch scary movies together every single night. That's something that they really cherished and really loved doing together. It was a great way for the two of them to spend that quality time together. So they were very, very close. Now, once Ashley got a little bit older and into her teenage years, she definitely started entering that phase that a lot of teenagers go through where they start having a little bit of an attitude. They start only wanting to be around their friends. They don't want to be around their family as much. They want to do what they want, when they want. And that was the phase that Ashley was entering. She started rebelling against her mom a little bit and had a strained relationship with her stepfather, who she had admired and looked up to as a father figure throughout pretty much her entire life. That relationship was really starting to grow tense. Ashley would not listen to him. She would start saying things like, you're not my real dad. And again, just start disobeying her mom. And around this time is also when Ashley started showing interest in boys and dating and And this is when she ends up getting her first boyfriend. When Ashley was 14, she started dating a boy named Gene Gill. Now, Gene was 16 years old. And at first, Ashley did try and keep the relationship with Gene a secret. But ultimately, Ashley's siblings told Jennifer about the relationship between Ashley and Jean. And the reason for this is that whenever Jennifer was off at work, Ashley would invite Jean over to her house and the two of them would spend time there and her siblings would see that and her siblings ultimately told her mom. Now, at first, when Jennifer found out about this, she was very upset. She did not approve of this relationship whatsoever for several reasons. Firstly, she didn't like that Ashley was bringing a boy into the house that she did not know 
know when Jennifer was at work. Now, secondly, Jennifer did not like the fact that Ashley, who was 14 years old, was dating someone who was 16 years old. And lastly, Jennifer really felt like Ashley was too young to be dating boys, period. So she did not like the fact that her daughter was dating, let alone a 16 year old, let alone having a boy that she doesn't know come over to her house where her other kids were while she was at work and behind her back. So because of this, Jennifer had to sit Ashley down and tell her that she needed to stop seeing Jean. Now, as you can imagine, when Ashley was told this by her mom, it really in turn only made Ashley want to see Jean more. So it really grew this rebellion against her mom to be even stronger. So strong that this is when Ashley began stealing money from Jennifer. And this was something that Jennifer always kind of knew. Ashley would kind of take some cash here and there. But then over time, the amounts of money that Ashley was taking would increase all the way until Ashley would steal her mom's entire paycheck. And at first, Jennifer was very confused about what Ashley was spending this money on. She didn't understand why Ashley was taking so much money and what she could be using it towards. However, she soon got her answer when one day Ashley came home with a tattoo of Jean's name on her arm. It was a tattoo of Jean and then a heart surrounding his name. And when Jennifer saw this, she said she was absolutely livid. She could not believe that Ashley would go to these lengths and do something that was so permanent, but Ashley was convinced. She said that she was in love with Jean and she was planning on being with him forever. Now, because of the rising tensions at this point, there was a lot of tension between Ashley and Jennifer, Ashley and her stepdad, and because of this, Jennifer decided that it would be best if Ashley went and stayed at her grandma's house for some time. Now, luckily, Jennifer's family all lived within a very close distance to each other. All of her siblings, the grandparents, they all lived fairly close together. So Jennifer's mom, Ashley's grandma, only lived about five miles away from Jennifer. So Jennifer thought that this would be a great solution to this issue, thinking it would give her and Ashley some breathing room just to be able to decompress from each other a little bit. And Jennifer also claimed that she thought this would help Ashley with her behavior. She felt like even though Ashley was okay with disobeying herself, disobeying Jennifer, that she wouldn't be okay disobeying her grandma. She felt like that was a different level that Ashley wouldn't reach. So that is why she decided to go ahead and have Ashley move in with her grandma. And at first, this plan seemed to be going very well. Ashley seemed to be staying out of trouble. She wasn't spending as much time with Jean. And she also started spending more time with different friends and also spending a lot of time at her uncle Kevin's home. Now, her uncle, Kevin Donathan, his house was pretty much the hangout spot for all of the cousins and Ashley really enjoyed going over there. She enjoyed being around her family. She enjoyed spending time with them and it was something to do. Jennifer claimed that while Ashley was at her grandma's house, if her grandma was ever out doing things, Ashley would be left home alone and she wouldn't really have anything to do and she would get bored fairly quickly. So going to Kevin's house was a great way for her to be entertained spend time with her family, her family to be able to keep an eye on her. It just seemed like a win-win situation. So now let's move on to where this case really begins, which is the 4th of July in 2007. Now on this day, it started out like any normal day. As I said, it was the 4th of July, so it was a holiday. And on the 4th of July, every year, Ashley's family always had a 4th of July party at her great uncle Keith's house. So everyone in the family, which there was a lot of people because they all lived fairly close to each other, everyone in the family would gather to great uncle Keith's house and they would have this 4th of July pool party. And this 4th of July was no different. So Ashley arrived alone. And according to some of Ashley's family members, when Ashley arrived to the house, she didn't seem like 
like her happy, usual, joyful self. When she got there, she seemed a little bit more sad. Just something seemed to be bothering her. She seemed a little down. Now, when Ashley was talking to some of her aunts, she told them that she had walked to Keith's house from her uncle Kevin's house. And that was about a two mile walk. And Ashley's aunts thought that maybe she was just overtired, had some heat exhaustion, and maybe just needed to liven her spirits a little bit. So they tried to help her in doing this by suggesting that she got into the pool with her cousins, which she did. And once Ashley got into the pool and started playing around with her cousins, it was like an automatic switch. Once she did that, she was laughing, she was smiling, she was dancing around with her cousins in the pool. They were playing together and it seemed to instantly liven her mood. And Ashley stayed at this party for about three to four hours before she decided to get dressed and get ready to leave. Now at this time, Ashley went around and she said goodbye to her family and told them that she loved them and that she would see them soon. Now when asked where Ashley was going, Ashley told them that she was going over to her Aunt Christina's house. Now Ashley's Aunt Christina only lived a few blocks away from Keith's home and at max it was said that this walk would have only taken Ashley about 10 minutes. So that was the plan that Ashley told everyone and everyone seemed to be very okay with this because again, it was only 10 minutes away. It wasn't a big deal. And so Ashley said goodbye to her family and left Keith's house at approximately 6 p.m. But little did anyone know that this would be the last time that anyone would ever see Ashley. On the night of the 4th of July, Jennifer figured that Ashley was either spending the night at her grandma's house or at her uncle Kevin's house, which she normally did. Now, Jennifer was not at the 4th of July party that day, so I just want that to be noted too. So she just figured, again, that Ashley was either spending the night with her grandma or spending the night at uncle Kevin's house, which again, a lot of the cousins did. However, after two days had passed and Jennifer hadn't heard from Ashley, this is when she started to worry. Usually Jennifer and Ashley spoke every single day or every other day, so to not hear from Ashley for two days was very unlike her. Now at this point, Jennifer starts calling around to different family members to see if anyone had seen Ashley. And in this lineup of phone calls is when Jennifer called Uncle Kevin to see if Ashley was over at his house. Now, it was in this phone call that Kevin claimed that he hadn't seen Ashley since the 4th of July. However, he also told Jennifer something else. Kevin told Jennifer that on the 4th of July before the pool party, him and Ashley had ended up getting into an argument. Now, the details of this argument are a little bit vague. However, what we know is that Ashley had allegedly been on her phone and was texting with another family member, almost gossiping about something in the family. And Jennifer said that this was very normal. They had a very big family. They all saw each other very frequently. There was a lot of cousins. There was a lot of aunts, a lot of uncles, grandparents. So it wasn't unusual to have a conversation about another family member. I think if you come from a big family or if you come from a very tight-knit family, that isn't the most outlandish thing to hear. So that is apparently what Ashley was doing. However, Kevin had apparently seen the text messages that Ashley was exchanging and told her to stop. Now, apparently, according to Kevin, Ashley then disobeyed him and told him no, that she was not going to stop. And according to Kevin, in response, he got angry with Ashley and as a result, took her cell phone and broke it. Now, what this now meant is that Ashley did not have a cell phone. So now no one had heard from Ashley in over two days and she did not have a cell phone. So she had no way of contacting anyone and no one had any way of contacting her, including her mother. Now at this point, Jennifer starts to get a little bit more frantic and she begins calling around to other family members to see if anyone had seen or heard from Ashley. However, no one had. And this is when the panic really began to 
set in. Now, the area that Ashley was living in in Cleveland, this specific area was heavily polluted with drugs and prostitution and sex trafficking with the average girls, the average age of girls being trafficked were between the ages of 14 and 17 years old, which was right where Ashley was. Now, once Jennifer realized that Ashley had no way to contact anyone and no one knew where she was, this is when she called the police to report her daughter as a missing person. Now, at first, the police were not overly concerned when it came to Ashley's case or really concerned at all. When looking at Ashley's pattern of behavior, police almost immediately put her in the category of being a runaway. Now, regardless of this, Jennifer kept trying to emphasize to police that regardless of the teenage behavior that Ashley was displaying, Ashley would not just run away. It wasn't like her. She absolutely loved her family. She wasn't just going to leave everyone without telling anyone anything. Now, something else that really emphasized to Ashley's family that something was not right was that Ashley was no longer active on any social media. Prior to her disappearance, Ashley was always on her social media, whether that was updating her status, talking to people in her comments. She specifically used MySpace at the time, but her last social media activity was on July Fourth, And I just want to stop for a second and make this note because I haven't already. Ashley told everyone when she was leaving that 4th of July party that she was going to her Aunt Christina's, which again was about 10 minutes away, but she never made it to her Aunt Christina's. So it's not like she went to her Aunt Christina's and then left later that night and no one saw her again. Within that 10 minute period that it should have taken Ashley to get from point A to point B, she somehow went missing. Now, after Ashley's family realized that she was missing, they immediately all band together and organized search parties and put up flyers. They were searching surrounding neighborhoods. However, they did not find her. Now, initially, in the very beginning, Ashley's family thought that it was a very strong possibility that Ashley could have ran off to be with her boyfriend, Gene. Now, according to Gene, he claimed that him and Ashley had spent almost every single day that summer together. So the summer of 2007, leading up to July 4th, he claimed that they were together every single day, regardless of her family's disapproval. However, at the time that he went missing, Gene actually had an alibi. He claimed that he was out of town at a family reunion. Now, regardless, Ashley's family still believed that Ashley and Jean were together. So because of this, Jennifer and other family members actually decided it would be a good idea to go over to Jean's neighborhood and start posting these missing persons flyers all over the neighborhood, hoping that Jean would see it or really, and what they truthfully wanted was Ashley to see it. They thought that if Ashley was with Jean and she saw that there were missing persons flyers for her, she would understand that she needed to call her mom. She needed to call her family. She needed to go home because now people thought that she was missing. So they were really doing this in hopes to entice Ashley to come home. However, to their surprise, the next day after they put up those missing persons flyers in Jean's neighborhood, they went back to that same neighborhood and noticed that all of Ashley's posters had been taken down, which is suspicious. Now, at this point, police decided to bring Jean in for questioning. However, to this day, what was said during that interview still has not been revealed to the public. What we do know is that Jean was interviewed by police more than once. However, he was never charged with anything and never named a person of interest or a suspect. Now, all of Ashley's family and friends had directly reached out to Jean as well via social media. However, the answer that he would give was always the same. He always repeated that he did not know anything and did not know what happened to Ashley. According to him, the last time that he saw Ashley was several days prior to the 4th of July when Gene and his dad dropped Ashley off at her uncle Kevin's home. But even at this point, Ashley's family was still 
not convinced that Jean did not have anything to do with this. And so Jennifer actually started following Jean. And one night she followed him, driving behind him, and watched him walk into an abandoned house. And Jennifer thought it was possible that Ashley was being held in that house. So she immediately called police to have them check it out. However, when they arrived and looked through the home, Ashley was not there. So now at this point, we're looking at one month after Ashley's disappearance. So this is August of 2007. Now on this day, Jennifer actually was on a break from work when she got a phone call from a blocked number. When Jennifer picked up the phone, she was shocked to hear what seemed to be Ashley's voice on the other end of the call. According to Jennifer, when she picked up the phone, she very quickly heard Ashley say, quote, it's me, mom, I'm fine, don't worry, before quickly hanging up. Now, Jennifer didn't have a chance to say anything back on the call. She didn't have a chance to talk to Ashley because the person on the other end hung up so quickly. Now, immediately at this point, Jennifer starts getting frantic. She starts calling around to her family, letting them know about this phone call that they just had. But over time, Jennifer really started to question the legitimacy of this call and really didn't know what to think. She had a hard time understanding why Ashley would call and hang up so quickly quickly without having a conversation with her mom or without talking with her mom and it made her question if it really was Ashley on the other end of that call and obviously because it was a blocked number she couldn't call it back it's not like she could call the number back again so that was really all she had to go on with it now there was another potential encounter with Ashley and this occurred on November 17th of 2007 and it happened while Ashley's grandparents were driving through the west side of Cleveland. Now, according to them, while they were driving on the road, they were passing a girl who was walking in the opposite direction of them, so they could see this girl very clearly. Now, according to the grandparents, they claim that this girl looked identical to Ashley, and that the only thing that was different was that this girl had short blonde hair and Ashley had long brown hair. Now, immediately after passing this girl, her grandparents turned the car around and drove back to try and get a better look of who this could have been. However, at that point, the woman was gone. So the question of was that really Ashley still remains. Now, six months after Ashley's disappearance is when the FBI finally got involved in this, and they started looking at this case from a different light. Now, around this time is when two other girls had also gone missing in the Cleveland area, and this is a very popular case, and if you guys keep up with true crime, you probably have heard this case before. This was the case of Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight, who were all held hostage by Ariel Castro in his home in Cleveland. Now, at the time, the FBI only thought that there were two women missing in this case, which were Amanda Berry and Gina De Jesus, and they weren't aware that Michelle Knight was also missing. There was actually never really a proper missing persons report filed for Michelle, and so they weren't made aware of Michelle's disappearance until after the fact, until Ariel Castro got caught in 2013. But again, in early 2008, when the FBI first got involved, they thought it was very possible that there was a connection between Ash Ashley's disappearance and Amanda and Gina's disappearance as well. Now, in 2013 is when Amanda, Gina, and Michelle were all found alive in Ariel Castro's home, and they were finally set free, and Ariel Castro was arrested. And this only raised speculation more that Ariel Castro could have been involved in Ashley's disappearance. Now, a big reason for this theory that the FBI had was the location. Ariel Castro's home was only about a mile and a half away from where Keith's 4th of July party was being held at his house. Not only did the FBI search up and down through Ariel Castro's home trying to see if there was any connection between Ariel and Ashley, any evidence to see that Ashley was ever there, they also searched all throughout that neighborhood. However, ultimately, they came up empty-handed and there was no evidence to prove that Ariel and Ashley were ever connected. And along with 
with that, all three of the girls, Michelle, Gina, and Amanda, who had been there for a decade at this point, they were held hostage for about a decade. They claimed to never have known about another girl. Now, this theory was very, very hard for Ashley's family for a multitude of reasons. First off is once it came out that there were women who were held captive in Ariel Castro's home, at first the media publicized that there were three women in total, however, had only named the two of them. They only named Amanda and Gina at first and did not name Michelle. And in the beginning, when there was not an identity to be placed for that third woman, Ashley's family was under the impression that that third woman was Ashley. They thought it was a very big possibility that the third woman in that house was Ashley. And they were actually, Jennifer claimed that she was prepared to get that phone call from the police. She was waiting by the phone for them to call her and tell her that they found Ashley in Ariel Castro's home. However, that phone call never came. Now, Jennifer also said that she never thought that this could have been a case of foul play or someone kidnapping Ashley. Like that thought never really came to mind mind when thinking about Ashley's case when she heard about the other two girls, Gina and Amanda. She claimed that when the FBI brought this theory to her, it wasn't something that she had thought about at first because she never imagined that Ashley could have been kidnapped or her case could have been related to the other two girls. So it was a very hard theory to hear at that time. However, again, regardless of that theory, I want to emphasize that there has not been anything made public in regards to evidence that would connect Ariel Castle Astro to Ashley Summers, at least when it comes to Ashley being in that home. Now, moving on from that, several of Ashley's older male relatives, like I've mentioned, she had many uncles, cousins, grandparents, several of those older male relatives were given polygraph tests. However, in regards to which one of her family members and what the results of those tests were, that has never been disclosed to the public. However, the FBI has emphasized that it was more so basic standard procedures procedure to conduct those tests rather than them being suspicious that any of these family members could have had anything to do with Ashley's disappearance. Now, something that the FBI also wanted to look into when they got involved in Ashley's case was the suspicious phone call that was made to Jennifer. They ended up pulling Jennifer's phone records and tried to get Jennifer to pinpoint when exactly the call happened because they wanted to be able to see if they could trace the call. However, Jennifer Jennifer claims that by that point, it was months later, and she didn't remember the exact date of that phone call. So now this brings us to 2015, and this is when there was a woman in Rhode Island who was caught on video surveillance footage at an ATM, and the FBI noticed that the woman in the picture of the surveillance struck an eerie resemblance to Ashley's age progression photo. Now, because of this, the media really pushed this out to the billboards, thinking that this could be Ashley. This surveillance photo was even featured on the Dr. Phil show, and really anywhere that they could get it out to, to try and get in as many tips as possible. The woman in the photo had also allegedly committed identity theft, which is why it made it more difficult to identify who it actually was. Now, along with this, the police also put out an alert to the media for any tattoo artists. Like I mentioned in the beginning, Ashley had gotten a tattoo of Jean's name on her shoulder, and it had been almost 10 years since Ashley's disappearance at that point, and the police thought that there was a good chance that she may have tried to cover up that jean tattoo that she got on her arm and wanted to see if any tattoo artists had worked with Ashley. So those were two alerts that were put out into the media. However, two days after the eighth anniversary of Ashley's disappearance, it was announced that the woman in the ATM picture had been identified and it was not Ashley. And along with that, there were never any tattoo artists who came forward who claimed to have worked with Ashley either. Now, something else that I want to point out in this case, and I just feel like it's important to mention, is that in December of 2018, Kevin, so Uncle Kevin, Ashley's Uncle Kevin, the Kevin who had the hangout spot house, the Kevin whose house Ashley was always over at, 
Kevin was charged with rape in 2018, and in 2020, he was sentenced to 35 years in prison on the rape charge, as well as charges of prostitution. Now, even with these charges, he has never been named a suspect or a person of interest in Ashley's disappearance. Now, with that being said, you guys, that is really where we are today in Ashley's case. And I know, I said it in the beginning, once we get to the end, you're going to be like, Savannah, there has to be more. And I know, I, I get it. Like I've had the same reaction, but this case really has come to a standstill. Ashley Summers would be 31 years old today and her family still holds on hope that Ashley will return home someday or they will at least get answers as to what exactly happened to Ashley on the 4th of July, 2007. Now there are a lot of possibilities in this case. There are a lot of theories. However, there is not one theory that is stronger than the next. There are just a lot of what ifs when it comes to the theories in Ashley's case. And along with those theories, I think we also have to believe that the police, when speaking to either Jean or Ashley's family members, that if they had any suspicion that they were involved or they could be potential persons of interest or or suspects, that they would have been further examined. However, again, we don't really know the lengths to which each one of them was interviewed or interrogated or questioned. So there's a lot of information that we're not working with as well. Now, the police have been very tight-lipped in this case in regards to those interviews and polygraphs, so we just don't really know a lot when it comes to that, and we don't know if we ever will. But I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case. I truthfully do don't really know where I stand. I think that there's a lot of possibilities as to what could have happened to Ashley. And I don't think anyone, at least when I look at this case, I don't think that anyone is ruled out. Um, I think that there are a lot of things that could have happened. And I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. So with that being said, you guys, please let me know in the comments below. And that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before you go, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye guys.